In Mary Gioi's fleet, Admiral Sengoku chastises Bartholomew Kuma for not going after the straw hats like originally planned, while Vice Admiral Monkey D. Garp tells the leader of the Marines about how Luffy was able to get away from yet another government foe. Even so, Garp assures Sengoku that Luffy is not one who will go and spread the fact of Gekko Moria's defeat to others. A few days after departing from the Florian Triangle and the ghost ship thriller Bark, the Straw Hats continued to follow the log pose in the direction it had been pointing since it last set on Water 7. After making their way through bizarre weather and fighting massive sea kings, they finally arrived directly above the location indicated by the pose, Fishman Island. However, instead of finding the long-sought-after destination, the Straw Hats encounter another obstacle, the Red Line, the continent that encircles the prime meridian of the world. Having originally entered the Grand Line at Reverse Mountain on the other side of the Red Line, this means that the crew have traveled halfway around the Grand Line, with the continent blocking access into the New World, and therefore to both Luffy's dream of becoming Pirate King and new crewmate Brooke's dream of getting back to Reverse Mountain and reuniting with Laboon. Therefore, the presence of the Red Line poses many problems to the Straw Hats. For one thing, the extremely tall red line looks impassable, preventing passage into the New World. Also, their exact location is close to many of the crucial government landmarks, including the Holy Land of Mary Gois and Marine Headquarters. With the log pose continuing to point downwards, Luffy, Robin, and Brooke decide to use the ship's shark submerge to search for any signs of Fishman Island, only to find nothing after reaching the limit of 5,000 meters except an angry rabbit sea king. Chased to the surface by the creature, Luffy defeats it easily with his Gomu Gomu no rifle, which made it spit out a small mermaid who lands right on a super-excited Sanji and a starfish. The mermaid, revealed to be named Kami, introduced herself by trying to sell the crew some takoyaki. Kami, after having introduced herself and her talking starfish, Papag, calls Hachin, but is shocked when someone else answers his Denden den Mushi. The macro pirates have caught Hachin, intending to sell him into slavery. Kami wishes to save him and Luffy agrees to do so, after consulting with Nami. Kami uses her ability to be able to speak with fish and navigates the ship towards Grove 44 of the Sabaudi Archipelago, having been told that Hachen is being held at the base of the Flying Fish Riders, which lies on this route. Before they arrive, they are attacked by the Flying Fish Riders, who after a brief battle return to their base to report back to their leader. Duval, an extremely tall man in an iron mask. After hearing that the ship has been identified as belonging to the Straw Hat Pirates, the mysterious man states his intention to kill the man who destroyed my life. Meanwhile, the Straw Hats approach the base, attempting to figure out ways to defeat the flying fish, although Luffy really just wants to ride one. Kami is worried about Hatchin, although Papig assures her that he will be safe. The macro pirates attempt to ask Duval why he made them retreat, and he replies by shooting harpoons at them whilst ranting about the man who ruined his life, striking fear into his own crew, as well as the fishmen. Macro himself tries to apologize to Duval for the stupidity of his own crew, but Duval congratulates them for revealing the straw hats to him. Meanwhile, Hatch and former Arlong Pirates crew member, now Takoyaki salesman, who is tied up in front of Duval, is both concerned about Kami and also afraid of hearing the Straw Hat's name mentioned again. The Thousand Sunny is spotted near the base and Duval is informed that that man is aboard the ship, whilst Hatchin tries to bribe Macro with Takoyaki to release him, however it does not work. As the Sunny nears the base, Kami is worried that her friend is in danger. The Straw Hats enter the base, and they notice it is too quiet, they find out that the base is not an island, but a small village built in the middle of the sea. Kami and Papag call out to Hatchin, who after seeing the Jolly Roger of the Straw Hats, covers himself in his own ink to disguise himself in order to protect his friends. The Straw Hats know that they are walking into a trap, but Kami and Papag freak out when Frankie yells at them of how blind they are to the obvious. They find Hatchin in a cage and front them warning them about the trap. The Straw Hats recognize the voice and shape of the octopus fishman and Sanji tricks him to talk about Arlong and his crew, revealing to the crew that Kami's friend Hachin is really their former enemy, Hachin of the Arlong Pirates. Kami is excited that they know him, but Zoro states that they are not his friends and Nami is considering turning away. 
This makes Kami sad and Papag angry at the Straw Hats, so they both jump into the sea only to be immediately captured by the Macro Pirates. Fortunately, Nami convinces the other Straw Hats to save Kami and Papag since, after all, Kami and Papag are their friends. Duval orders the flying fish riders to attack whilst Luffy rescues Kami and Papag using his devil fruit abilities and orders Zoro to free Hatchin and the rest of the Straw Hats to battle. Hatchin asks Kami and Papag to get out of the way, while the macro pirates fume over getting Kami back. Luffy says that he is ready for them all, while Kami and Papag cheer for him. Zoro, Sanji, and Chopper prepare themselves as dozens of flying fish riders emerge all around Thousand Sunny. Luffy is however distracted because of his fascination with the flying fish and tries to find one to ride then grabs hold of one by holding onto the rider. Meanwhile, the flying fish riders begin to bombard the ship, leaving Sanji to deflect all of the bombs being dropped. Luffy manages to pilot one of the fish, but the attack leader orders the entire crew to dive underwater including Luffy, which renders him helpless. Chopper and Brook try to save him only to realize that they cannot swim as well. This infuriates both Nami and Frankie who rescue them while complaining about extra work that they caused. The macro pirates see an opportunity and try to capture Kami, only for them to find that Zoro has freed Hatchin from his cage while they were not looking. Hatchin defeats them quickly by uppercutting them into the air. Hatchin reunites with Kami and Papag, but they are attacked by a flying fish rider, though they are quickly saved by Zoro. Hatchin thanks Zoro for rescuing him and tries to apologize for the events in the past. Usopp defends the ship by using a cannon to shoot down the flying fish, with Chopper praising his skill. As the Straw Hats find out that there are a multitude of flying fish riders in the sky, Brook becomes ashamed that he cannot lend a hand in his first fight as a Straw Hat pirate. He then unsheathes his blade and jumps high in the sky and uses his violin to unleash a musical sound wave that puts the riders as well as Chopper and Luffy to sleep. This move allows Brook to perform a quick attack on the sleeping riders while running on water, and it also allows Luffy to grab a flying fish only to find it and its rider are asleep, which causes him to plummet into Duval's room, wherein Luffy sees his unmasked face, with an extremely shocked reaction. Meanwhile, Brook spots that Zoro's wounds after his battle against Kuma still have not healed, however he tells Brook that he's fine enough to take on the flying fish riders. Hatchin complains to Zoro and Brook that they should still keep their guard up, but Kami and Papag praise Hatchin. Hatchin turns his back and lowers his guard only to be attacked by another rider, but is saved by both Zoro and Brook. As the group of riders attack the Sunny, they fall to a combination attack of Nami's climb attack and Robin's clutch skills. Chopper goes into arm point and attacks a fish, and using a new technique Kokutii Diamond, which leaves a diamond-shaped impression on the fish's skin, while Frankie uses strong hammer on a rider, after the above-mentioned realizes that bullets do not affect him. Kami and Papag watch the battle, amazed by the strength of the Straw Hat crew. Usopp advises Frankie that they must dock the ship because the riders have an advantage on open sea and Frankie agrees with him, but tells him that they can't because the flying fish riders aren't giving them enough time to steer the ship. Luffy appears running towards Zoro, Brook, Hachin, Kami, and Papag, announcing that a giant iron-masked man on a giant cow is approaching them when they hear the bull's roar. They realize that it is the Duval's beloved bison, Motobaro. Duval shouts that he does not need the base anymore, his only wish is to kill the straw hats. He reveals that that man is none other than Sanji. The straw hat crew on the ship try to remember who he is, but Sanji draws a blank. Suddenly, Duval shoots his scorpion-poison-tipped harpoons at them and screams at him that it is something just recent confusing Sanji even further. As Sanji tries to tell Duval that he does not know him, Luffy tells Zoro that he has seen his face and that the whole Straw Hat cruise knows this face well. As Luffy violently removes Duval's mask, it is shown to the whole crew and the riders that by a cruel twist of both fate and irony, Duval was born with a face that is a perfect replica of Sanji's wanted poster. Duval shouts that he wants his life back and that marines and bounty hunters have been after him since the poster appeared, but Sanji, upon seeing the face, leaves the sunny, swims to the base dock, and immediately kicks Duval in the face, claiming he does not care. 
Sanji and Duval argue with each other about the wanted poster. While the straw hats on the ship are amazed that something like this could happen, Frankie has one of his emotional moments, whilst the straw hats on the dock are amazed at what they are seeing. Brooke just laughs, prompting Sanji to yell, Oh, I'm so kicking your ass later, Brooke. Sanji argues to Duval that he could have changed his appearance all this time, making Duval and the rider sport a why did not I think of that face while Sanji remarks on their stupidity. Duval reveals his past to everyone he was once a mafia boss on a remote island, doing his usual job until powerful bounty hunters and marines came after him and forced to wear his iron mask to protect himself. Sanji beats him up and says he has had enough of his accusations. Duval orders his riders to reveal a steel fishing net and trap Sanji in it, dragging him into the sea. Luffy tries to rescue Sanji and Zoro also tries to go in Luffy's place. However, Hatchin says that he's faster underwater and he will go. Duval then states that flying fish are the fastest creatures underwater, and it is futile to try to chase them. Suddenly, Kami jumps into the sea to rescue Sanji, and Papag remarks that Duval is wrong. He agrees that the fish are fast, but that there is nothing faster in the oceans than a mermaid. Luffy is amazed at this revelation, and Papag says that if she keeps her guard up, Kami is uncatchable. Whilst they were distracted by this, the flying fish riders reveal that they are carrying a very huge anchor from an extraordinary large ship and are planning to drop it on the Thousand Sunny. Usopp asks Frankie if they could use the paddle or coup de burst to get them away. Frankie states that there is not enough time but reveals that he has built in a secret weapon for times like this. Reaching the bow of the ship, Frankie tells everyone to believe in Sunny. As the riders drop the anchor, Sonny's figurehead spins like a propeller revealing the emergency evasion secret weapon chicken voyage to everyone and making the ship go into reverse. The riders are baffled about the prospect of a reversible ship. Frankie tells Usopp that there is a secret compartment inside the prowl and reveals a new feature of the Sunny, much to the excitement of Luffy and Chopper. A cannon reveals itself from within Sunny's figurehead's mouth, and Frankie tells Usopp to get as many riders as he can. Usopp locks on and fires, revealing the incredible destructive power of the Gaon cannon. Frankie explains that it takes three barrels of cola for Kuub de Burst and two barrels of cola for Gaon cannon, warning them only to use it in emergencies. Meanwhile, Kami manages to rescue Sanji and has trapped the fish riders in their own steel net. As Kami reaches the surface, Nami asks if Sanji is all right, and Kami says that he is safe but bleeding from his nose due to his usual perverseness. Duval is now furious that Sanji is still alive, but Luffy remarks that his henchmen are now all gone. This further infuriates Duval, and he unleashes the full rage of his bison Motobaro onto Luffy. But to everyone's surprise, Luffy, reminiscent of Shanks, somehow makes the bison drop his rider, trot a few feet away, and then faint. The Straw Hats, including Luffy, are amazed and confused about how he did it, further angering Duval. However, at this point Sanji arrives back on the dock and tells Luffy he will take care of the rest. Just as Duval is about to attack, Sanji performs the same face-bashing techniques that he did on Wands on the sea train. The Sunny is back at sea and the Straw Hats are heading for Sebeati Archipelago. They have a takoyaki party with Hachan cooking. Chopper, Brook, Sanji, Usapi, and Asap, and especially Luffy are gorging themselves, enjoying it thoroughly. Hachen tentatively asks Nami if she likes it, to which she replies that she has not forgiven him yet, but likes his takoyaki nonetheless. The entire crew enjoy the takoyaki with even Sanji being amazed at the flavor, until the eating trio of Usopp, Yuffie, and Chopper can continue no longer just as well as Hachen collapses exhausted from trying to keep up with their servings. It is then that Duval, whose face has become handsome, finds them. He expresses his gratitude for the change and gets into fits about his own beauty, then gives the crew his Den Den Mushi number, saying if they need anything to just call him up before he and his gang now rename the Rosie Life Riders to part. The crew arrive at Sabadi after Papag and Kami explain to them about the two ways of getting to the New World requesting permission from the government and passing through Mary Gois or going through Fishman Island and are amazed at its structure large trees, blowing bubbles. Hachen then says they will need a special coating to make sure the ship gets to Fishman Island all right. Hachen promises to take them to a mechanic he would bet his life on, 
but they have to promise not to oppose the world nobles. People who are allowed to live in merry GOIs and are sometimes seen walking around Sabadi, even if someone were to be killed before their very eyes. Osapi, Frankie, and Sanji stay on the sunny to fix the damages to the ship, or in Sanji's case, to look after the treasure at the behest of Nami, while the others explore the island. Zoro is the last to leave much to the shock of the others, as they know of his lack of direction. But Zoro points out he just has to look at the numbers on the grove trees to remember where they are docked at and to ask directions if his gets lost. The three agree to this though tell him not to trust himself while he remembers the number of the grove as one. However, a bubble had floated in the way at the time revealing the grove to actually be 41. Meanwhile, Luffy, Nami, Chopper, Robin, and Brook tour the island with Hachin, Kami, and Papag acting as guides. Hachen warning them not to draw attention to themselves as even though pirates walk freely on the island, so do marines and bounty hunters. Plus, if they are captured and sold as slaves, the law will not help them. He also mentions to treat Kami and himself as regular people, claiming it'll be easier for them even bandaging the mark on his forehead, something Luffy notices. After which, the fishman shows the straw hats the wonders of island and how they make use of the bubbles, from making bikes out of them and using them for transportation to holding their souvenirs and balloon-like bubbles to even creating hotels and shopping malls out of them, the latter of which Nami and Robin depart from the group. However, Robin cannot help but notice Kami acting reserved since they have reached the island. No sooner than they leave the group, a pirate captain runs through the town, begging the citizens to remove a collar from his neck. He pleads that he's given up on the new world and just wants to leave, even claiming he has a wife and child, the latter who's never even seen him since he was a baby. Hachan, however, tells the group not to help him as he is a slave of the world nobles. After mentioning this fact, the collar activates and blows up the captain, though he surprisingly survives still feebly begging to leave, while a shadowed figure holding an axe and bounty poster identifies the captain from above a building. Two nobles, Rosward and his daughter Shalria, show up afterwards, causing everyone to bow as they pass. After their dog Saru urinates on the charred captain, Shalria kicks him before shooting him with a pistol. Luffy nearly attacks them after seeing this, but Hachan stops him. Rosward and she then casually walk away, talking buying another slave. The group then talks about the oddity of it since the pirate looked strong enough to deal with both nobles but Papag comments that wounding one would make the offender the target of one the admirals. When asked what gives the nobles such special treatment, the starfish tells them that they are the descendants of the ones that created the world government, and due to this, they have become abusive with their influence. Despite having witnessed the cruelty of the nobles, the group continue on encountering a few bounty hunters along the way. After Luffy, Chopper, and Brook easily take care of them, the group find themselves in Grove 16, which Hatchin explains is a lawless region of the island. He goes on to explain that Grove 1 to 29, which make up the interior of the island, are like this, while the surrounding groves house the entertainment and shopping districts. Finally, after a bit of traveling, they reach Grove 13 and a bar where the coding engineer is said to stay. Upon entering, they meet the owner of the bar Shakyuaku Shaki for short, a former pirate and friend of Hatchin. After the usual meet and greet, Shaki reveals she has been following the Straw Hats exploits and that she was even chased by Garp during her pirate career. When asked about the engineer Rayleigh, Shaki tells them he is not there though has not left the island. When Luffy suggests waiting for him, she reveals that he has not been back in a half a year pretty much wandering the island's bars and casinos. Hearing this, the group agree on searching for him to which Shaki warns them to be careful in doing so, as since the Straw Hat's arrival, that now makes 11 rookie pirates with over Billy 100 million bounties on them that have reached the red line, Luffy being the second highest of the ranks in terms of bounties. Most of the supernovas are staying in Grove 24. First off comes Capone Gang Beach Billy 138 million a mafia-type pirate who is dining at a restaurant and complaining of the food. When one of his crew tries to warn him of the marines, he attacks him with a fork. Then Big Eater Jewelry Bonnie Bully 140 million, who's in the same restaurant, is living up to her title by eating an enormous amount of food and demanding more of it, despite the cooks going as fast as they can. 
There is also the magician Basil Hawkins, Belay 249 million, who tells a pirate who got spaghetti spilled on him that it's an unlucky day for him. In another section of the grove, two of the rookies used as Captain Kidd, Belay 315 million, and Roar of the Sea. Scratchman Apu Belay 198 million are fighting against one another. Meanwhile, in Grove 21, two more pirates are doing the same the Mad Monk Yerush Belay 108 million, a Burkan, and a masked individual called Massacre Soldier Killer Belay 162 million are about to go all out until Red Flag X Drake Belay 222 million, a former Marine officer, breaks the two up. As Drake walks on, the last of the rookies, Surgeon of Death Trafalgar Law Belay 200 million, asks him how many people he's killed. Shaki tells them all the pirates beyond this point are the best of the best. She also reveals that Kid only has a higher bounty than Luffy himself because he caused damage to civilians and that she's rooting for the straw hats. Even after hearing this, Luffy responds that he will just relax for the time being but is a bit worried for the engineer. However, Shaki tells him Rayleigh will be fine because he's far stronger than the rookies. Finished at the bar, Luffy's group soon head out to look for Rayleigh. Shaki sees them off, informing them that although the marines are aware of some of the big names on the island, they have their hands full with another matter and gives one last warning not to make a big scene before they head out. Meanwhile, in another section, another kidnapping group led by a large individual named Hound Pets Peterman has found out about Kami being a mermaid through the bounty hunters the Straw Hats encountered earlier and plans to kidnap her. Luffy's group reach Groves 32, 33, and 34, also known as Bubbles Island, which is the haven of Sabayati Park, the theme park of the island, and begin their search there. They'll moreover spend their search riding the rides and having good time, even fulfilling Kami's dream of riding the Ferris wheel. However, unknown to them, they are being followed by Peterman. Meanwhile, in Grove 24, we meet another noble, St. Charlos, who was left behind by Shalria and their father, which he blames on the pirate he was riding on like a horse by kicking him. Charlos then spots some doctors transporting a gravely injured man by stretcher and stops them. Charlos is insulted by their supposed lack of respect for him. He then spots the nurse with them and instantly claims her to be his wife. Both the nurse, named Marie, and one of the doctors, who incidentally is her fiancé, object to this which Charlos responds by shooting the man with his pistol much to Marie's horror. Charlos then has his servant take Marie away as she pleads for someone to help her lover. Zoro just happens to walk by, ignorant of the rules about nobles. He catches the attention of Charlos who steps in his way. Zoro asks if he needs directions which angers Charlos. The noble instantly pulls his pistol on Zoro and fires. But the swordsman easily dodges and goes for a counterattack. Bonnie, however, tackles Zoro into the ground before he can do so, putting up an act as if he was shot and killed. Charlos, at first thinking Zoro dodged, shrugs it off and buys it before he and his subordinates go on their way. Once gone, Bonnie instantly chastises Zoro for his actions and almost bringing the admirals on them. Zoro, however, is clueless to the whole situation while most of the supernovas, who were watching and commenting on everything, are impressed by his strength and murderous intent. Zoro then picks up the doctor that was shot and goes to locate a hospital, much to the confusion of Bonnie since after all he is a pirate. Back on the sunny, Frankie, Usopp, and Sanji are taking a break when Chopper calls them on their Den Den Mushi. He frantically informs them that Kami was kidnapped. Peterman's gang somehow got the drop on Luffy's group and managed to steal her away, making matters worse is that they do not know which group took her and where she is since the island is very big and there are many human shops. Sanji tells them to stand by, since they are dealing with a kidnapping gang. They need experts in this field. Sanji then reveals he's calling the Flying Fish Riders. Duval and his gang soon reach the Thousand Sunny, but soon he and the Straw Hats get to the task at hand. Back at Sabayati Park, Luffy, Hachan, and Papag have split off to search for Kami despite Sanji telling them to stay put, leaving Chopper and Brook behind. The fish riders reach them, and they set off to search. The flying fish riders then split up to find kidnapping teams while a few go off to collect the remaining straw hats. Meanwhile, in a human shop in Grove 22, Luffy shaking down the owner on if they have Kami, 
but the shop does not. The three leave with Luffy and Papag shouting out for Kami and drawing attention to themselves. Papag cries, blaming himself for the mermaid kidnapping as it was when he went to go get ice cream for Kami when she was abducted. The starfish then goes on about how he shouldn't have brought her to the island in the first place, claiming it wasn't just kidnappers but the whole island is their enemy. In a shopping mall in Grove 30, Robin explains to Nami the history of the relationship between human, fish, and mermen. 200 years ago, the fishmen race was classified as just that, fish, and were persecuted by humans. Even with their superior strength, human numbers outweighed their own with kidnapping and slave trade being the most common of methods on the fishmen. Finally, the world government signed a treaty with Fishman Island, and these methods were abolished though Sabati Archipelago still continues this trade. As she finishes the explanation with her theory on why Hatchin and Kami have to hide their true form, some of the fish riders arrive with Frankie quickly explaining what happened to Kami. Back in Grove 22, Papeg also finishes explaining this story to Luffy and continues to rant about not letting Kami come to the island. Hachan tries to apologize for the trouble, but Luffy dismisses the apology by telling them they have done nothing wrong and tells the two that all three of them are their friends now and that he vows to save Kami no matter what. Just as he makes this claim, they spot the flying fish riders heading toward them. Meanwhile, in Grove 1, home to a human auction ground, Peterman has just left the ground, having given them Kami while Rosward and Sharia soon arrive at the house. Also, there are Kid, Killer, and their crew, as well as Trafalgar Law. Meanwhile, in the waiting room of the building, Kami is brought before the head auctioneer named Disco, who is excited to have a young mermaid in the auction. Kami yells that Hatchin will make them pay, which earns her a slap and beating from Disco, though the pleas of his subordinates stop him as he damaging the merchandise. However, Kami still presses her threat, before Disco can become angrier with her, though he suddenly passes out. As his staff rush to find a doctor, one of the captives, a giant, tells another that he knows he was the cause of Disco fainting with his burst of spirit. When asked who he is, the culprit just claims he's an old man that cannot ignore a young girl. This man turns out to be Silver's Rayleigh, former first mate of the Roger Pirates, the Pirate King's right hand. At a marine base, it is revealed to Garp that Rayleigh is being sold at the auction house, who comments that he probably is selling himself to pay off a gambling debt. He also tells the marine reporting to him not to mention this to anyone else and that he will take care of it. Garp says that Rayleigh is not to be underestimated just because of his age and many good men could be hurt or worse if handled the wrong way. The auction soon begins with a pirate musician and winemaker being the opening item as the Straw Hats continue their search. While questioning the kidnapping team that brought the giant mentions a mermaid at the auction house to Usopp, who alerts the others searching. Duval is berated by Sanji for traveling so slowly, but Duval reveals that he was heading to Grove One all along. They meet Chopper there with Frankie, Nami, Papag, and Hatchin following shortly, while the others are on their way with Zoro lost on foot. After questioning an employee who refuses to help them, Frankie suggests using force to save Kami, but is reminded that the nobles could be inside and could alert the admirals. Nami suggests they then play by their rules and try to buy Kami back, which causes Hachan and Papag to cry over her desire to help them and not being able to repay her. When entering the auction house, they are soon seen by Kid who notices Luffy is missing and wonders how big of an idiot Luffy really is. Meanwhile, several of the other supernovas are reading the paper when they discover the reason behind the marine shortage in Sabati, even though they are so close to marine headquarters. Ace has been scheduled for a public execution, which is commented that will bring Whitebeard's wrath and start a war between him and the marines. Back at the auction, Charlos arrives and joins the other nobles there as the next auction, a pirate captain named Lakuba, begins. However, before any bids are made, Lakuba's mouth suddenly starts bleeding before he promptly collapses. Disco quickly closes the curtain while Sanji comments that Lakuba bit his own tongue off, preferring to face death than slavery. With this incident, Disco decides it is time to bring out Kami next, who's been fitted with an explosive collar and put into a fishbowl. After much fanfare, Disco introduces Kami to the crowd, prompting Nami to get ready to bid for her. 
However, Charles blindsides her and everyone in the house with an instant bid of belly 500 million with no one to outbid him. As Disco begins to close out Kami's auction, Luffy crashes into the auction house as the fish rider he was with could not land properly. Zoro is with the two as well having been picked up on the way to the house. The Straw Hats themselves were astounded by the sudden arrival of their two most powerful members, as was everyone else in the auction. Upon seeing Kami, Luffy rushes the stage despite the protest of Hatchin, who is forced to use his remaining arms to try and restrain him. This unfortunately reveals his identity as a fishman to the crowd, and they immediately raise a panic, confirming Robin's earlier story of discrimination against fishmen. A shot suddenly rings out, stopping the commotion. Charlos has shot Hatchin with his pistol, much to the horror of the straw hats, Papag and Kami, who pounds furiously on her fishbowl. Charlos then begins to gloat while Luffy makes his way towards the world noble. Hatchin tries to stop him, reminding Luffy about the promise not to harm them and citing the fact that he was a pirate and that he deserved it anyway. He apologizes further, stating he only wanted to make up for his past actions to Nami and help any way he can, but only got in the way. Charlos hears enough and tries to shoot him again. Luffy, already angered, no longer restrains himself, and not caring about the rules anymore, gets up and punches Charlos in the face. The whole room is speechless after such an attack save for Law and Kid who are amused. Luffy apologizes to his crew for the attack though they understand given the circumstances and were even indifferent Zoro even commenting he wanted to slice Charlos, instead commenting that this recent development had just made everything less complicated as they are, after all, pirates. Rosward is obviously not pleased, sending the place into yet another panic. The audience quickly clears out to avoid the world noble's wrath and the guards set upon the straw hats and a fight ensues. While Rosward demands for an admiral and shoots at Luffy to no avail, Zoro slices Kami's fishbowl in half. More fish riders arrive, dropping off Brook, Robin, and Osop, who accidentally falls on Rosward, knocking him out and sparking more of the guards' anger as they take it as an attack. Luffy tells the group that they would leave once Kami has rid herself of her collar, but Law informs him that the Marines already have the place surrounded. Shalria suddenly makes her way to Kami's fishbowl, intending to kill the mermaid. However, before she can pull the trigger, she suddenly faints. The back wall is suddenly ripped open, revealing Rayleigh and the giant the giant prisoner from before. The giant states that Rayleigh was just there to take the auction house's money, as well as any from whomever buys him. Though Rayleigh adds that no one would buy an old man for a slave anyway. As the guards stand there in shock, confused as to what they should do about this new development, Rayleigh spots Hatchin and asks what he was doing there. Upon seeing Kami, however, he connects the dots before using another burst of spirit on the guards, knocking them all out. Rayleigh then spots Luffy, commenting that he has been waiting to meet him. The news of Luffy hitting a world noble quickly spreads throughout the island, causing more widespread panic. Most of the supernovas quickly decide to leave the island to avoid the inevitable dispatch of an admiral, though a few who are curious decide to stay behind and see which admiral will come. At Mary Gois, the news has reached Sengoku, who becomes greatly irritated upon hearing that it was Luffy who committed the act. A marine informs him that the pirates have taken the world nobles hostage at the human auctioning house or public employment security office, as he calls it, but have not yet given any demands. An admiral, Kizaru, speaks up suddenly, telling Sengoku that he will handle it. Back at the auction house, Disco has called his boss, revealed to be Doflamingo, about the situation. However, Doflamingo has no interest in the conflict or the slavery trade anymore and leaves it to Disco effectively abandoning it. He also states that the seven warlords of the sea have been called together to engage the Whitebeard pirates. As the marines continue to mobilize outside the house, Rayleigh manages to remove the collar from Kami and throws it aside before it explodes without the need for a key, much to the astonishment of the straw hats and to the annoyance of Frankie who had just found the keys. He throws them to the remaining slaves to free themselves. Rayleigh apologizes to Kid and Law for the blast from earlier, though comment they cannot be normal if they manage to survive it. Both brush it off rather amazed to have run into the Dark King himself. 
Rayleigh replies that he is merely a simple coding engineer now and warns not to use the former title as he would prefer to live a peaceful life. He then checks on Hachan and thanks the Straw Hats for saving him before telling the group that they should leave. However, the Marines have the place covered by now and demand that they release the world nobles. Kid offers to take care of the Marines while the others escape. However, Luffy and Law seem to take it as an insult and join him in battle. The Straw Hats ready themselves for a fight and the giant slave from before offers to get the other slaves out while they thank the Straw Hats for freeing them. Back outside, the Marines open fire with mortars, but Luffy and Kid reflect them back, with Luffy doing so using his Gomu Gomu no Fusion move, and the latter repelling it using only his hand to do so. Law, meanwhile, covers an area with a spherical barrier using his ability and cuts off one of the Marines' heads within the sphere, though the action does not kill him. Instead, he replaces it with a cannonball that promptly explodes, hitting those that were near his decapitated body while Law holds the Marine's head in his hand. It now becomes clear that the two other captains alongside Luffy are no mere pirates and the marines realize that they are dealing with devil fruit users. Despite this revelation, the marines continue to press the attack. Luffy, Kid, and Law easily destroy them all. Luffy uses his Gear 3 technique, Law his rune move as he chops up body parts and rearranges them on the marines and Kid his power over metal as he forms an arm of said material and strikes at the marines with it. Soon, the Straw Hats arrive and see the damage caused by the three captains' rampage. Rayleigh delights in all the mayhem being caused. The Marines' reinforcements are deployed hoping to contain the offenders until Kazaru arrives. The pirates, however, have no intention of staying that long. Kid prepares to pull out and warns Luffy, stating that the next time they meet he will not be as merciful. Though Luffy replies that he will be the one to find the One Piece which shocks Law and Kid. Kid then comments that anyone who makes that claim in the Grand Line would be laughed at, though in the New World anyone without the nerve to say something like that would be as good as dead. He then concludes by telling Luffy and Law that they should all meet in the New World again someday. With that, he and his crew bowl through the Marines and head out. Law decides to head back to the auction house as his bear, Bipo, defends him. The Straw Hats soon join the fray, spotting Duval and the Fish Riders. The Marines prepare to shoot him, but Robin saves Duval before they can do so. The others clear a path for Frankie and Rayleigh to get Kami, Hatchan, and Papag out first before they follow. Nami covers their escape with a thunderbolt tempo. Law soon emerges from the house with a slave who was under the nobles, John Bart, a former pirate captain who joins his crew as thanks for freeing him, though Law states that half of his thanks should go to Luffy. Meanwhile, Kid's crew manages to clear the house and destroys a bridge to keep the Marines at bay. However, just when it seems they will get away, Kid is suddenly hit. To their horror, the culprit blocking their escape is one of the seven warlords of the sea, Bartholomew Kuma. The Harp Pirates are still fighting off the remaining Marines at the auction house, tearing through them to escape. However, they come across the Kid Pirates, most of whom are already wounded due to Kuma. The Warlord of the Sea immediately identifies and attacks Law, but Law manages to dodge the attack. With the Marines starting to close in from behind, Kid and Law, despite their mutual dislike of the other, tell Kuma they are leaving and prepare to face him. In Grove 8, Peterman has been thrashed by the Straw Hats and the Rosy Life Riders for his earlier abduction of Kami. After giving back Kami's backpack, they depart promising to aid them till they leave the island. The Straw Hats then head back to Shecky's bar to treat Hatchin's gun wound. As they do so, they talk with Rayleigh where he reveals he was a member of Gold D, Roger's crew and served as his first mate. Much to their surprise, Hatchin apparently knew this too, but did not tell them since they just needed a coding engineer. Rayleigh also reveals how he met Hatchin the fishman had saved Rayleigh's life when he was a kid, and they had remained friends till Hatchin joined Arlong's crew, then named the Sun Pirates. Sanji then questions how he could still be alive if Roger's crew were captured, to which Rayleigh reveals that Roger actually turned himself in. The government just made it seem that way to show their strength to the public. Rayleigh goes on to tell the reason why was because four years before he was executed, Roger came down with an incurable disease. 
His crew, however, came across Crocus at the entrance of the Grand Line and asked him to join Roger on his final journey to keep his disease in check. Finally, after three years, they had managed to conquer the Grand Line. This surprises the Straw Hats, Brooke especially, since Crocus did reveal to them that he was a pirate doctor for a time. Rayleigh even tell them that the reason Crocus joined was to find a certain pirate crew which the Straw Hats figure must have been the Rumbar Pirates, bringing tears to Brooke's eye sockets. Rayleigh continues, telling them that after they conquered the sea, Roger was dubbed the Pirate King. However, the title was meaningless since he was about to die. But Roger enjoyed it anyway through parties and fighting as a way to co-op with the future. Eventually, Roger disbanded his crew who silently went their separate ways, fates unknown. One year later, Roger turned himself in to the Marines who decided to make a public execution of him to throw fear into pirates around the world. However, Roger had other plans, his last words to Rayleigh being, I ain't gonna die. Partner. Then on the fateful day of his execution, Roger made his famous speech to the world which in turn created the current age of piracy. The Straw Hats are astonished by the story. Rayleigh then tells the group about Buggy and Shank's apprenticeship aboard Roger's ship, the latter of which ran into Rayleigh ten years afterward who told Rayleigh about Luffy, claiming that had met a kid that said the same things as their captain did. The story suddenly shifts to a harbor at Grove 27, where a pirate crew is about to set off. Before they can do so, they spot a ship on the horizon that suddenly fires a cannonball with a person actually standing on top it. The ball lands in the harbor amidst the pirates and the figure, revealed to be Kizaru, awaits orders from his Den Den Mushi. Back at Shaki's, Rayleigh congratulates Luffy for making it this far into the Grand Line and offers to do the coding job for free much to the Straw Hat's pleasure. Robin then asks him about the Void Sentry, telling Rayleigh about a note written by Roger on the Poneglyph in Skypea. Rayleigh explains that the Roger Pirates did indeed find out the whole history, though he advises her to continue looking for it on her own. Rayleigh says that maybe she could reach different conclusions than those that they reached. Still, he offers to reveal it to her, but Robin politely turns him down agreeing with his earlier advice. Rayleigh also reveals that Roger could not decipher everything, like a genius such as Clover. Roger just could hear the voice of all things. Usopp then asks Robin if she would want to let an opportunity like this get away and start to question Rayleigh about the One Piece. However, Luffy stops him demanding that the mystery of the treasure remain hidden since countless pirates were risking their lives just to search for it. He then threatens to quit being a pirate if any of the crew asked Rayleigh about it, stating, I don't want to go on a boring adventure like that. Usopp apologizes for his actions before Rayleigh asks Luffy if he can really conquer the Grand Line. Luffy replies that he does not really intend to conquer it, only that the person with the most freedom in the ocean would be the Pirate King, which brings a smile to Rayleigh and Shaki's faces. Rayleigh then tells the crew he will have their ship coded in three days, which until then, the crew will have to avoid trouble. Thus, the Straw Hats decide their best bet is to split up and draw attention away from the shop. Shaki gives each member a Viver card so they can find their way back to Rayleigh once the coding is finished who decides to move the Thousand Sunny to a safer location. With that, they bid Hachin, Kami, Papag, and Shaki farewell for the time being and head back into the groves. Luffy suggests hiding in the theme park, though the others, save for Chopper and Brook, reject this idea. In Grove 27, pirates are trying their best to distance themselves from Kizaru. One pirate tries to shoot the admiral, but the shot does not even seem to phase him. Kizaru then blurs in front of them, trying to ask them where he can find someone named Sentamaru, but the pirates run away in fear. Kizaru then attacks them with light coming from his foot, which he kicks out outward. This not only hits the pirates, but also topples a mangrove in the process, much to the disapproval of his troops. However, Apu, who is nearby, does not seem impressed by his power. In another part of the area, a few of the marines have been turned into either old men or children, the culprit of such being Bonnie, who laughs at them as she stuffs her face. A few more marines encounter and surround Capone, but he informs them they have already lost. Kizaru then come across Hawkins, whose crew wish for him to run. He calmly tells them, though, that today is not his day to die. Back with the Straw Hats, 
As Usopp tries to convince Luffy not to go back to the amusement park, a figure stands before them prompting Luffy to ask who he is. The Marines confronting Capone quickly find out, to their bewilderment, what he meant by his earlier statement as he reveals his ability and opens up compartments on his chest. Inside are his crew, now miniatures, who quickly attack the Marines with cannons before charging at them on horses. In both cases, growing to normal size once outside of Capone to overrun the squad. In Grove 41, Yuruj has an encounter with Kuma and is having difficulty fighting him. Meanwhile, back in Grove 24, Hawkins's crew keep pleading for him to run as Kizaru approaches, but the captain is more focused on his pack of tarot cards, meeting his chances of fighting Kizaru, running from him, defending himself, and probability of death after the encounter the last of which reads 0%. Hawkins then tell Kizaru that he has not seen the person he's looking for. Kizaru then replies he gets bored easily and that he cannot let a high bounty like Hawkins get away before using his ability to deliver a speed of light kick at him, then firing off another shot from his fingers. However, in Grove 27 in the harbor, two pirates suddenly double over from pain, getting hit from seemingly out of nowhere. It then revealed that Hawkins used his voodoo-like ability and transferred both of the attacks to dolls that grow on his right arm. Yerush suddenly toppled by them, bruised badly and citing his bad luck at running into a warlord of the sea, and upon seeing Kizaru, an admiral as well. Hawkins informs him that the shadow of death is not upon him yet, though he takes this news as a joke. X Drake suddenly appears and kicks Kuma aside. Kizaru instantly recognizes the pirate while X-Drake comments he wasn't trying to run into an admiral. Yuruj then recovers and increases in size, becoming huge. Now ready for a counterattack while Apu continues to look on from a roof enjoying what's occurring before him. Back in Grove 12, the Straw Hats encounter yet another Kuma who fires a beam at Luffy, though he manages to dodge it as well as be amazed by it alongside Chopper. His crew then inform him of their encounter with Kuma on Thriller Bark before Frankie fires a coup de vent on the Warlord of the Sea in retaliation for that attack, knocking him back. Realizing that Kuma is very strong, Luffy goes into Gear 2 while Sanji and Zoro prepare to attack as well, though the latter realizes that this Kuma seems different from their previous encounter. Meanwhile, in Grove 49, the axe-wielding shadowed figure from before commenting Kizaru is late, and that if he does not hurry there will not be anything left. Back at Grove 12, Frankie, Usopp, and Brooke just barely avoid a blast from the Kuma they are facing. As Kuma goes to fire again, Luffy, Sanji, and Zoro rush him and perform a combo attack, managing to knock him down. Luffy then questions on if the Kuma they're fighting is a fake, to which Sanji and Zoro question as well due to this Kuma's attack style not fitting the one that they faced before. The three then come to the conclusion that there's more than one Kuma running around. Meanwhile, Yuruj is pounding away at the Kuma he's fighting but is shot in the shoulder in retaliation. X-Drake notes that Dr. Vegapunk has even managed to integrate Kizaru's light-based powers into the pacifista cyborgs. Kuma then attacks Drake who retaliates with his rare ancient Zoan devil fruit and manages to injure Kuma though he gets injured in the process as well. Yuruj takes note of the Kuma's injury too, but is kicked from behind by Kizaru through three buildings. Seeing this, Hawkins transforms into a large voodoo doll-like creature and attacks Kizaru but is easily repelled. Just when it seems Kizaru will finish him off, he's saved by Apu who severs Kizaru's right arm before exploding him with a blast of sound. Apu starts gloating and leaves the scene only for Kizaru to suddenly appear before Apu as a ray of blinding light and kick him straight through a building. Immediately afterwards, Kizaru sends Drake flying and defeats Hawkins by blasting him with a laser through his body. With all four of the supernovas defeated, he is contacted by the axe-wielding figure who yells at him. He decides to then go after either Law, Kid, or Luffy. Meanwhile, all the Straw Hats work together to bring down the Kuma clone Zoro, who is still hurt from his wounds on Thriller Bark, struggles to stand up and Sanji tells Luffy to first bring down the clone before tending to Zoro's injuries. Though the former notes that Zoro is still suffering from the aftermath of the events that occurred in Thriller Bark. Chopper uses Cloven Rosio Mitel on Kuma, enraging him and causing him to try and blast Chopper only for Frankie to nail him with his strong hammer. 
Kuma easily sends Frankie flying, but Frankie is saved by Robin, who uses her spider net to catch him. Brooke tries to attack him from above only for Kuma to try and blast him, but he is saved by Usopp when he uses Atlas we see to distract Kuma. Suddenly it seems like Usopp's attack managed to injure it badly. Frankie notes that the Kuma clone is like him enhanced with weapons but still only human, and that one of Usopp's explosive projectiles must have gone inside his mouth and dealt severe internal damage. Kuma tries to blow them all away with a laser from his mouth only for his mouth to be clamped shut by Robin causing to shoot himself. Nami quickly strikes him with a thunder lance tempo. This, however, only causes Kuma to go berserk. Sanji uses flambid shot to knock him back. Zoro uses Kiki Kutoryu Ashura and Ashura Makusen to damage Kuma before Luffy uses Gear 3 and Gomu Gomu no Jigant rifle to finish him off. After the battle, the straw hats are completely wiped, having had to use all their strength just to fight the Kuma. They soon start to discuss what to do next when someone calls out to them. Now from the sky drops the axe-wielding figure, along with yet another Kuma cyborg, in the middle of the straw hats. The figure introduces himself as Sentamaru, and the Kuma clone known as a pacifista. PX1 the one the straw hats defeated was PX4. PX1 soon fires on the group forcing the straw hats to dodge. This prompts Luffy to decide they must now split up and run. Sanji sticks with Nami with Frankie tagging along. Usopp goes with Zoro with Brooke joining as well out of concern for Zoro's injuries. Leaving Luffy, Robin, and Chopper together. The three groups run in different direction promising to meet up in three days. Usopp tries to cover their escape with a Hisatsu Kimuri Boshi. But PX1 blows up a bridge preventing Sanji's group from escaping before appearing right in front of them. Sentamaru goes for Luffy's group prompting Luffy to try to gatling him. Sentamaru easily deflects the attack with his palms and sends him flying much to Luffy's shock. Sentamaru then hits him again and knocks Luffy into a tree. An explosion nearby halts the fight, which Luffy notices it came from where Zoro's group ran. Indeed, his group ran into the worst possible scenario as Kizaru reveals himself before them. Zoro himself has taken the brunt of the Admiral's attack and compounded with his previous injuries, can no longer move while Brook and Usopp tried desperately to keep Kizaru from killing Zoro. However, none of their attacks work since, as Kizaru reveals, he ate the Pika 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 no Mai, a Logia type that essentially makes him a light man. Kizaru then goes to finish Zoro off, but the attack is suddenly thwarted by Rayleigh's intervention who manages to kick Kizaru's leg and divert the light attack. Kizaru greets the Dark King. While Rayleigh tells him not to pluck the fine sprouts, i.e., the straw hats since their era is just beginning. Afterwards, Luffy orders for everyone to concentrate on running away, telling them they cannot fight. They all start to run, with Frankie using a cube de vent to distance himself, Nami and Sanji from the pacifista. Kizaru, however, heads for Zoro's direction to attack him, but Rayleigh stops him in his tracks, even managing to cut his cheek. Afterwards, the pacifista begins to attack Zoro, but is temporarily stopped by Sanji and Brook, both of whom are quickly defeated. Luffy is then attacked by Sentamaru and knocked into one of the mangrove trees. Rayleigh and Kizaru begin a sword fight, with Kizaru using a light sword. The pacifista then attacks Usopp, causing him to drop Zoro. Chopper enters Monster Point to try to help. Pacifista is stopped from its attack by the real Bartholomew Kuma, who then asks if Zoro were to go on a trip, where would he like to go? Zoro then disappears right in front of Usopp's eyes. The crew is completely shocked by Zoro's disappearance. Luffy demands to know what has happened to him, to which Sentamaru unwittingly answers, telling him if a person touched by Kuma's paw, they go flying for three days though where they end up is uncertain. Sanji and Usopp continue to question where Zoro is just as PX1 prepares to fire at them from behind. Kuma, however, warps to it and makes it disappear confusing both the Straw Hats and Sentamaru. Luffy yells for the remaining Straw Hats to run to which they oblige. Kuma, however, advances on the injured Straw Hat Sanji, Usopp and Brook prompting Brook to try to defend the latter too. However, he is vanished by Kuma. 
Sanji quickly gathers himself and goes for an attack, but is easily knocked aside, leaving Usopp to himself. He tries to fire a star, but vanishes before he can do so. Angered, Sanji rushes to Kuma again, but is vanished as well. Luffy is quickly losing his morale after seeing four of crew disappear, right before his eyes while Rayleigh continues to battle Kizaru. Kuma passes by them and whispers something to Rayleigh, prompting him to question what he is doing. Kizaru inquires as well, but Kuma brushes him off. Luffy then enters gear two. Kuma ignores him and goes for Frankie and Nami. Frankie launches a strong right, striking Kuma directly in his face, but showed no sign of harm to him. Luffy launches himself at Kuma in gear two with a strong punch, but Kuma catches his fist easily and tosses him side. Luffy's efforts does not deter the warlord before he causes Frankie to vanish. Nami is next to go as she is in the midst of calling Luffy for help. Luffy again tries to attack Kuma, but he warps to Robin and Monster Chopper, causing them both to vanish despite Luffy's pleas for him to stop. Now alone, Luffy loses any remaining will to fight and collapses to the ground in despair, berating himself for not being able to save even one of his friends. Kuma then appears before Luffy, paw raised. He tells the captain they will not meet each other again before Luffy too disappears at his touch. A caption then comes up saying that on this day in Grove 12 of the Sabiati Archipelago, the Straw Hats were completely and utterly defeated. <laughs> Oh, oh, DJ!